Omega. When you think of Atlas, what kind of franchises come to mind? Persona, Shin Megami Tensei, Catherine? For me, it's none of the above. When it comes to the publisher's lesser known titles, I always point people in the direction of Vanillaware, the studio perhaps most famous for games such as Dragon's Crown, Muramasa the Demon Blade, and the more recent Game Awards nominated strategy title, 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. But the game that catapulted the studio to fame was 2007's Odin Sphere for the PlayStation 2. Odin Sphere is an incredibly unique side scrolling action RPG, offering fast paced beat em up style combat and a dense interconnected story but perhaps its most important feature of note is its gorgeous art style. Like, I don't usually get into the whole our video games art debate because, duh, of course they are, but literally every frame of Odin Sphere is a work of art. No questions asked. My history with the game isn't as robust as, say, Knights or Monkey Ball, but having played it again recently on my Vita, I had to talk about it. Believe it or not, my first introduction to Odin Sphere was at Anime Expo of all places. Back in 2016, I was the manager for the Cosplay Masquerade show for the event, and one of our groups cosplayed some of the characters from the game. It may have been a few years late, but I never forgot about that group's skit, and in the midst of the pandemic just starting to hit the United States, I decided to purchase the 2016 remake titled Odin Sphere Leaf Thruzier, as I was desperately looking for a new game to play during quarantine that wasn't Animal Crossing New Horizons or Doom Eternal. To say that I was hooked would be an understatement, as Odin Sphere quickly became one of my favorite games of all time. But to understand how Odin Sphere became such a beloved cult classic, we have to travel back to the late 90s. On December 7th, 1997, the Japanese exclusive action RPG Princess Crown was released for the Sega Saturn. Helmed by former Capcom veteran George Kamatani and the developers at Atlas, the game was a side-scrolling fantasy adventure that told the story of a crowned princess named Gradriel and her quest to stop the resurrection of the demon lord, Lalva. However, Gradriel wasn't the only character you controlled. The game scenario was split amongst three additional characters, and to gain a full understanding of the narrative, you could play through their scenarios to further flesh out the story. But the most striking feature of Princess Crown is its art style. Kamatani, who spent his years at Capcom primarily as an artist and designer, was inspired by the illustrations of John Tenniel and his work on Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland, and you can see the influences present in Princess Crown's presentation. All this starting to sound familiar? Well, keep all of these points in mind, because it's important to know that even though Princess Crown was lauded for its storyline and art direction, it sold abysmally at the time, and its commercial failure not only led to the closing of Atlas's branch in Kansai, but to Kamatani's blacklisting from the industry, and a proposed sequel for the Dreamcast being cancelled altogether. I have plans on covering Princess Crown in full at a later time, but because the game is Japanese exclusive, no fan translation is available just yet, so it'll be some time before the game gets a video of its own. Anyways, back to Kamatani-san. For years, Kamatani struggled to find work after Princess Crown's financial failure, jumping between jobs at Sony and Square Enix until he left the company in the middle of production on Fantasy Earth Zero, a title he was developing with his newly founded studio, Puruguru. Kamatani left Square with two other developers at his side, programmer Kentaro Onishi and artist Shigetake, whose only major credit from what I could find was an obscure Nintendo DS title called Kumatanchi in 2008, a feature vanillaware title that never saw a release outside of Japan, so this might be the reason why info is so scarce. With the three developers serving as the company's only employees at the time, Puroguru was then changed to vanillaware, and in 2004, development began on what would become Odin Sphere. This time, Kamatani took inspiration from Norse mythology and traditional fairy tales, wanting to expand on the ideas and design philosophy of Princess Crown. Much like the heroine of his previous game, Kamatani wanted the lead character to be a princess, and that character would eventually become Gwendolyn, princess of the Valkyries and daughter to the king, Odin. I gotta say, I love Gwendolyn's design. The blue wings, her hair, her crown, and the way her armor also takes on the form of a ballet dress really gives her an iconic look all her own. She has absolute transition goals if I'm being honest. But Gwendolyn isn't the only star of the show. We also have Cornelius, Mercedes, Oswald, and Velvet. Each has a different scenario that connects the sprawling story of Odin Sphere together, and in order to see it through to the end, you have to play as all five of them. But what exactly is the story of Odin Sphere? 
Hold on to your butts, guys, because in order for me to really do this game justice, I have to talk about its narrative, and as such, I'm going to be spoiling a ton. So if you have any plans of playing the game, either click off the video now and come back when you've finished at least one of the characters' scenarios. So the minute you start Odin Sphere, you'll be given control of a little girl in an attic. This little girl is Alice, and she often comes up to the attic to read some of her grandfather's storybooks with her cat Socrates. In case it wasn't obvious, Odinosphere frames its narrative from Alice's perspective. In the beginning, only Gwendolyn's story is available by default, but as you progress further, more of the characters' books will appear, and you can freely go back and forth between each character at will once you've unlocked them. Personally, I think this is genius. Having Alice in the library and the attic essentially be your character select screen is really clever, and adds a bit of charm to the aesthetic of the game as a whole. You can even pick up your furry friend and carry him over to the chair with you, which serves a double purpose aside from just being super cute. By petting Socrates, you can see a visual of when each of the different scenarios takes place in conjunction with each other. That is such a cool detail, and I'm amazed it made it into the game. Okay, enough stalling, let's actually talk about the story now. Many years before the events of the game, the land of Arian was ruled by the good king Valentine. The crown jewel of Valentine, however, was the Crystallization Cauldron, a weapon that absorbs pure magical energy from the Earth, also known as Phosons, to summon forth powerful magic. Valentine quickly became corrupt over his usage of the cauldron and went mad, using the cauldron to wage war against the other nations, but ultimately ended up destroying himself and his kingdom in a single night. The devastation of Valentine cursed its inhabitants by transforming them into these rabbit-like creatures known as pukas. However, two of Valentine's blood survived the curse, Ingwe and Velvet, the last royals of a forgotten kingdom. With Valentine in ruins, the nations of Ringford and Ragnanaval rose to power and waged war against one another for ownership of the cauldron, thus leading into the beginning of the game's events. It's the Aesir versus the Vanir in a war for conquest, with Odin leading Ragnanaval and the Fairy Queen Alfaria leading Ringford. But while all of this is going on, many outside forces have been secretly trying to fulfill a series of prophecies surrounding Armageddon and the destruction of Arion as a whole. One of those forces is the corrupted King Valentine himself, but we'll get to that soon enough. Velvet, knowing of the prophecies and the destruction that both her grandfather and the cauldron brings, spends most of her scenario trying to prevent another catastrophe, and at one point manages to deactivate the cauldron temporarily with a ring belonging to her grandfather. This ring, called the Ring of Tetrell, becomes a major focus of just about all of the storylines. So not only does Velvet have to get the ring back, but she somehow has to make sure the cauldron doesn't fall into the wrong hands. All the while, Velvet's lover Cornelius, a prince from the nation of Titania, is turned into a puka by Ingwe, and spends most of his scenario trying to find a way to break the spell, while also protecting Velvet in secret, due to his fear that Velvet will reject him in his new form. It's in Cornelius' story that we first discover what's become of Valentine. Rotting away in the netherworld after he died, Valentine manages to find a way to escape alongside Cornelius after he awakens in the land of the dead. Valentine reveals his plan to fulfill the prophecies of Armageddon alongside a trio of wizards calling themselves the Three Wise Men. And while Cornelius and Velvet are able to quell some of those fears, they have no idea what's in store for them. Gwendolyn starts her story in the middle of the Cauldron War as she fights alongside her older sister Griselda. But things end in tragedy as Griselda is slain in battle, leaving Gwendolyn to take her place as the leader of the Valkyries. Often seen by her father as a lesser version of her older sister, Gwendolyn sets out to prove her love and loyalty to her father, all the while learning more of Odin's intentions. Said intentions involve Velvet, who is revealed to be Odin's illegitimate child and Gwendolyn's half-sister. You see, Odin kinda pulled a Zeus and had an affair with Velvet's late mother, Princess Ariel. However, upon Valentine learning the identity of the father, he brutally strangled her to death. That is evil. Knowing that Velvet will be put to death at the hands of his trusted general, Gwendolyn defies her father's orders and rescues Velvet. As punishment for her defiance, Gwendolyn is placed into a deep sleep where she will be awakened and forced to love the first man who kisses her. That man is the Shadow Knight Oswald. Who is Oswald, you ask? He's my least favorite of the main cast, if I'm being honest. He's an orphan child in the wielder of a dark sword, working as a mercenary for Melvin, the Fairy Queen's nephew, and his adoptive father. So while there's elements of tragedy to Oswald's story, he just comes off as boring in retrospect, and the subsequent romance between him and Gwendolyn feels kinda half-baked. Yeah, I forgot to mention that at one point, Velvet gives the ring to a dragon named Wagner for safekeeping. 
but Oswald manages to slay the dragon and gives the ring to Gwendolyn as a sign of his love for her. That love is short-lived, however, because Gwendolyn gives the ring to Odin instead. Luckily, Gwendolyn eventually comes to her senses and manages to get the ring back after she begins to reciprocate Oswald's feelings. Hell, Gwendolyn straight up uses the ring as a bargaining chip to rescue Oswald from the Land of the Dead, seeing as Odin knows how to travel between the realms with ease. That's right, Gwendolyn battles against the Queen of Death herself to save the one she loves, and after she successfully rescues him, she decides not to give the ring to her father, choosing instead to defy him once more. Total freaking badass. In fact, a running theme with Gwendolyn and Oswald's romance is how Oswald doesn't want to treat Gwendolyn as an object and respects her for the woman she is. Gwendolyn is asleep. I cast a spell on her as punishment for disobeying me. The one who awakens her shall receive her undying love. The spell will compel her to act in that manner. How can you treat your own child as an object? She is my daughter. I shall treat her as I wish. This is because at one point during his story, Oswald learns that in order to power the sword he carries, Melvin made an exchange with the Queen of the Underworld for his soul. Realizing that he was nothing more than a means to an end, Oswald simply wants happiness and respect for the woman he loves, especially after realizing just how little Odin actually gives a shit about her. That whole forcing her to love a stranger garbage was pretty much a lie, proving that Gwendolyn's love for Oswald is in fact genuine. It's these aspects of Oswald's story that I legitimately enjoy, but between him and Gwendolyn, I believe Gwendolyn is the more interesting character as I loved seeing her become a more independent woman who stands up for herself and eventually escapes the shadow of her fallen sister. Inferno King, you are no different than the men back home. I am not an object. What? But the character whose storyline is the most engaging and properly paced in my opinion is Mercedes. After her mother Elfaria dies at the hands of Odin, Mercedes is reluctantly thrust into the position of queen, and her scenario not only follows her maturity as a leader, but also her battle against Melvin and his attempt to seize the throne from her. Seeing Mercedes go from this childish princess to a crossbow-wielding badass capable of taking on Odin is incredibly satisfying, and her growth as a character feels just right in terms of length. Not too long, but not too rushed either. However, Mercedes doesn't do all of this alone. Throughout her story, Mercedes is aided by a talking frog who used to be human. Much like the story of the Frog Prince, only a kiss can change him back, and Mercedes' maturity is reflected in her reluctance to kiss him. Eventually, Mercedes fulfills her promise and kisses the frog to reveal that it was Ingwe the entire time. I think this is a clever twist because at this point in the story, Ingwe is framed as kind of an asshole to Velvet, considering his treatment towards his sister and especially Cornelius. So to see him being helpful and want to see Mercedes succeed in becoming a good leader is a great contrast to his previous appearances. It's even hinted that he and Mercedes have a thing for each other by the end, which is just adorable, but ultimately tragic for reasons I'll get to soon enough. One of Kamatani's main influences for Odin Sphere's narrative were the works of William Shakespeare, and you can see shades of that littered throughout the story. Whenever a character is speaking their inner thoughts, a ray of light appears from above, almost like a stage light shining down on our players as they monologue about how all the world's a stage. It's both silly and clever at the same time, lending itself well to the Shakespearean aesthetic Kamatani was going for. But sometimes the influences are a little bit more direct. Velvet and Cornelius definitely give me Romeo and Juliet vibes, two star-crossed lovers who long to be together but just can't because of circumstances beyond their control sounds a lot like Romeo and Juliet to me. Just, you know, with more floof. That isn't to say all of Odin's fair story ends in tragedy. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of melodrama to go around, but every character's story does end on a happy note. The ending to Cornelius' story is especially heartwarming. Seeing Velvet accept Cornelius despite his new form and even going so far as to kneel down to hug him is just the cutest thing and I just can't! Actually, if we're being real here for a second, I think Velvet and Ingwe's story is pretty engaging too. I dunked on Ingwe earlier, but both he and Velvet suffer from a lot of trauma. King Valentine basically haunts the two siblings with painful memories of how he murdered their mother and physically abused them. Poor Velvet's first reaction to seeing her undead grandfather is one of utter fear. I mean, aside from the fact that the dude's a literal walking skeleton, he threatens to whip her. Okay, hold up a second. If this book is being read by a literal child, is no one concerned about the content she's reading? Do I need to call child services? 
Seriously, Valentine is so far gone in his own insanity that he's willing to do anything to bring destruction to the world, and the permanent damage he's left on his grandchildren is truly despicable. Especially knowing that at one point, underneath all of that hatred, he was once considered a good king. Really, it seems like everybody has family issues in Odin's sphere. Cornelius' father has a dark past regarding how he killed his father and inherited the throne, and while it might not seem like any of these little subplots mean anything at first glance, by the time you reach the final book, that being the Book of Armageddon, everything comes into focus in such a wonderfully crafted finale. But before we can get there, I think it's finally time we talk about Odin Sphere's gameplay. I should briefly mention that all of the footage I've been showing is coming from Lathrasir and not the original PS2 version. The reason this matters is because Lathrasir makes a lot of changes to the core gameplay of Odin Sphere, and honestly, the differences are immense. Trying to go over just what was changed from both versions could be a video in itself, but the core basics are there. The remake was helmed by Kentaro Onishi, with Kamatani taking a backseat in a producing role. Onishi, who served as the lead programmer on the original game, wanted to address the most common criticisms of the original game, while keeping the story and art style intact. While the original game definitely has its merits, I think Lathrasir changed a lot of these elements for the better, as I tried playing the first chapter of Gwendolyn's story in classic mode, and oh boy, it was rough. So my explanation of the gameplay will mostly revolve around what's currently available in Lathrasir and not the original. But the fact that the original game in its base form is available from the get-go is insanely commendable, especially for those who may not gel well with the refinements that Lathrasir introduces. But getting back on topic, as mentioned previously, Odin Sphere is a side-scrolling hack-and-slash RPG. Every character has a set of combos you can perform by rapidly pressing the square button. But the game also controls similarly to Super Smash Bros., where if you tilt the joystick in a certain direction, you can juggle enemies into the air or slide under them to break their guard. Every character has a double jump and glide if you hold down the X button, and depending on which character you use, you'll get a unique animation for them. The way these combos play out is based on the character you're currently playing as. Every character has a different type of weapon or gimmick that makes them different from each other. But in addition to your standard attacks, you'll collect these crystals known as Phozon Prisms, which allow you to perform special physical and magical attacks. Physical attacks take up some of the stamina from your power meter, while magical attacks take up points from your Phozon count. Stamina refills naturally over time, but Phozons are in shorter supply. Luckily, you can get some back from defeating enemies and pulling them in with your weapon, or using a potion to refill your count. Some skills are gained naturally after clearing a battle screen, but others are locked away in hidden areas throughout each stage. This is personally one of my favorite aspects about Odin Sphere's level design. You could just go through each area and focus on getting to the boss as quickly as possible, or you could take the time to explore and be rewarded with new equipment and skills to help make your adventure that much more satisfying. The way that you get some of these skills too can be a clever callback to retro gaming as a whole. For instance, in Oswald's storyline, you get one of them by going into an empty room and just waiting there in silence for three minutes. Whoever came up with the idea to sneak in an Earthbound reference of all things deserves a raise, in my opinion. Adding on to this, every battle screen has a ranking system from S to D, with S giving you the best rewards. There's many different factors that go into getting the best rank for each battle, but some factors include getting a high combo, using your cipher skills, taking a little damage, and beating the fight in a certain amount of time. The ranking system is incredibly satisfying to engage with because the better you play, the better items you get. So there's a reason to battle enemies and go for the best grade. But even if you have a bad run with a particular screen, you can retry the battle as many times as you want. That is, if you don't open the treasure chest the game gave you before restarting. Going back to the Phozons for a moment, considering the fact that Phozons are the main source of energy fueling the weapons and world of Arion, you collect and spend a ton of them over the course of the game. You see, Lathrasir introduces a skill tree system that allows you to power up both passive and active skills as you collect them with your current character. The more Phozons you have, the more you can tailor each character to your playstyle. But for those who are inexperienced in action games, you can assign your favorite skills to the circle button and again, like Smash Brothers, activate a move by tilting up, down, left, or right. If you're playing on higher difficulties, simply spamming spells and button mashing may not get you through the game, but if you're playing on normal or easy, then you can easily cheese just about any fight you come across if you know what to invest your ciphers in. But your weapons aren't your only form of assault. That's where alchemy comes in. 
As you traverse through each stage, you'll constantly come across empty bottles and different types of mandragora that allow you to mix different potions together. Some of these can include different types of statuses, such as poison, burning, freezing, you name it. You just gotta make sure to hit them before you pick them up. Though, I kinda feel bad doing that since they run away the minute you pluck them from the ground. Look at this little pepper just casually spit fire before meeting its inevitable demise. To say the alchemy system in Odin Sphere is dense would be a huge understatement. There are tons of potions you can concoct, all with their own strengths and weaknesses. You can craft potions to reduce knockback from enemy attacks, increase the amount of gold enemies drop, turn invisible, gain extra phosons to spend however you please. That's just barely scratching the surface. And as you explore each of the stages, you'll find yourself discovering all sorts of different recipes to make something new. But perhaps my favorite mechanic that Odin Sphere introduces is its leveling system. You gain experience points from defeating enemies like normal, sure, but they give you only one experience point for each enemy you kill. Instead, you level up your characters by eating food, and there's a bunch of different fruits, veggies, and other edible matter to help increase your levels. As if that wasn't enough, starting from chapter 3 in whatever scenario you're playing, you'll be introduced to Mori the Wandering Chef. Mori is a puka chef who can be summoned in every level once you reach one of the game's many rest stops. If you happen to stumble across a certain recipe throughout your adventure and have the necessary ingredients to make the dish, he'll cook it for you free of charge. This helps increase your level by a considerable amount, and if you want a chance of surviving the many dangers ahead of you, it's definitely worth your time to go out and gather whatever materials you need to level up, even if that means using phosons to grow your own fruit trees. Later on in the game, you'll be granted access to the Puka Village, which houses two different restaurants to dine at, the Rabbit Cafe and the Puka Kitchen. Both of these serve the same purpose as Mori's touring restaurant, but these establishments require a specific kind of currency. During Cornelius' story, it's revealed that the only way to break the Puka curse is to recover the magical coins created in Valentine, and once all of them are gathered, a single wish can be made to break the curse. But here's the kicker. As you naturally play the game, you can see that you've been collecting these coins all along, and the better you do in each battle, the more you'll gain as a reward. The fact that this seemingly small story detail also serves a purpose gameplay-wise is a great incentive to go back and replay older levels and get better ranks. Instinctively, I want to help these people become human again, and the fact that I'm rewarded with higher level increases and bonuses makes it all the sweeter, and I wish more games would do something like this. So that's the basic gameplay that each of the main characters share across all five storylines. But what about them makes them different from one another, you might ask? Think of it like Sonic Adventure, where the game offers multiple playable characters, but unlike that game, Odin Sphere is more focused and has a better sense of synergy between play styles. For instance, Gwendolyn uses a spear specializing in ice space attacks, making her the all-arounder of the roster. Once Cornelius becomes available, however, the paradigm shifts and the other characters' differences become much more noticeable. Because of his small stature, Cornelius makes up for his lack of reach with some insane speed, and uses his magic sword to unleash some really nifty lightning-based attacks that can stun enemies from a distance. If you choose your skills wisely and level up some of Cornelius' best abilities, you will absolutely destroy everything in your path. Look at him go, doing flips and shit like Yoda at the end of Attack of the Clones. Mercedes is perhaps the most unique of the roster. She can fly indefinitely for one thing, but she comes packed with a rapid-fire crossbow that shoots out some major magical energy. However, her ammunition is tied to the power meter, and the only way to refill it is to stop shooting and let her reload. You can't reload while flying, either, so Mercedes' best method of strategy is to keep her distance in the beginning, and as you level up, spend your points to help boost her reload speed or gain ammo after defeating an enemy. Believe it or not, Mercedes' mechanics were the default for the entire roster in the original Odin Sphere. The power meter had more significance, as even a regular combo took up some stamina. The fact that even regular attacks were tied to the power meter is what makes playing the original version so difficult, so keeping it tied to only Mercedes' weapon does make a degree of sense. I love playing as Mercedes, though. A lot of her special moves allow her to summon familiars into battle to assist her, but I personally love giving her more mobility with the crossbow. Some of these moves just look and feel like they were ripped straight out of Contra, because Mercedes is packing some serious heat! Look at this madness! She even gets some auto-scrolling flying stages. Gosh, she is so much fun to play as. Oswald is all about power, and gains a special Berserk mode after defeating enough enemies. This Berserk mode significantly increases his speed and strength, wiping the floor with bosses and acting as great crowd control in the process. 
While his standard attacks aren't all that special, what makes Oswald fun is that he can summon shadows to inflict damage on his enemies, and when you enter Berserk mode, these powers are also doubled in strength. Again, just look at all of this. Lastly, we have Velvet. Velvet uses a magical chain to cover a vast area during combat. She specializes in flame-based attacks and has some insanely powerful skills. Whether it be sending out a pair of flames to chase down her enemies, or slamming her foes back and forth like Hulk on a Monday, Velvet is an absolute blast to play as, and she may just be my favorite of the roster aside from Cornelius. I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but again, just look at all of this! Now I know what you're probably thinking. A lot of this can and does sound overwhelming at first, but one of Odin Sphere's greatest strengths is how it eases the player by introducing all these mechanics in an easy to understand way. You'll learn all the basics of combat, alchemy, and leveling by your first playthrough, so by the time you finish Gwendolyn's story, you'll be ready to tackle on the next character, which the game thankfully gives a short tutorial for just so you know the differences between each of them. But alas, not all of Odin Sphere's gameplay is perfect. While I've praised the game's visuals, I think some of the stage design is a little… familiar? I mean, you have the snowy mountains of Winterhorn Ridge, the melty molten caverns of the Fire Kingdom, the spooky kingdom of the Netherworld, the alleyways of Titania, the wastelands of Valentine, the city of Nebulopolis, and the forests of Elrit and Ringford. Thematically, they're not much different than a Mario game, leaving a lot of visual variety to be desired. There's also the issue of navigating these stages. Most of the arenas are looped in a circle, and whenever I'm moving in one direction, I find that the game is telling me I'm going the opposite way. So trying to get used to the circular stages can be a bit bothersome, but I also believe that having five playable characters who all control the same inevitably leads to repetition, and this is the most apparent in the boss battles. No matter who you play as, you're bound to fight more than one of the same bosses between all of the characters, and very few of them get any that are unique to their storyline. For instance, take Odette, Queen of the Dead. She serves as the final boss of Gwendolyn's storyline, which is fine and all, but once you start Cornelius' story, you have to fight her again at the end of the first chapter, and the fight never changes no matter how many times you have to fight her. It's like, God damn it, Odette, I don't care about you and your undead mommy milkers, just die already! I will admit that Odette's character design and attack patterns are probably some of the most unique in the game. Aside from summoning a bunch of undead soldiers to distract you, she lifts up her dress to reveal spider legs? What the fuck? Some of the mini-bosses are fun, so I don't mind fighting them again, but others serve as nothing more than a test of patience. The frostbends from Winterhorn Ridge absolutely suck. They're huge, can do tons of damage, and can freeze you like it's nothing. I actually died a few times with Oswald trying to fight a pair of them, but after dying more times than necessary, I moved on. I'm also not a fan of the boss fights with the sorcerers. Not because they're hard, but because they teleport constantly after you get a couple hits in. So it becomes a matter of just waiting around before you can do anything. I did manage to kill them as a frog when one of them put that status on me, so that was hilarious. <laughs> but I think a lot of these issues come at the price of having an interconnected storyline. Thematically, it all makes sense. Each of the characters are encountering these bosses at different times, so it makes sense that there would be some repetition, but a little more variety would have helped go a long way, which thankfully, the Book of Armageddon delivers on. We're finally getting there, folks. After completing Velvet's storyline, one more book will appear in the library for you to select. This is Odin Sphere's grand finale, and serves as a boss rush of sorts. The game up to this point has been hinting at the prophecies depicted at the end of the world, and as you progress throughout the game, you'll collect several pieces of lore that go into just about everything including the game's world, characters, and overarching storyline. Trying to summarize everything that happens up to this point would be a Herculean task in of itself, but I'll try my best to keep it brief. I mean, you've been watching for this long, haven't you? It's written that five disasters will lead to the destruction of Arian, a six-eyed beast, the rise of the Lord of the Netherworld, a massive fire, a giant cauldron, and a powerful dragon. When you start the final book, the game will give you a choice between which of the characters will face off against each one of these threats. If you've been paying attention and have been following along with all the clues, you'll know the proper character order and your reward for doing so will be the true ending to the game. The Six-Eyed Beast refers to the Beast of Darkova, a giant three-headed dog like something straight out of God of War. This beast is actually Ingwe. Near the end of Velvet's story, Ingwe reveals that he stole the Book of Transformation, the same book containing the page on the Puka Curse used to turn Cornelius, to gain the powers of the Netherworld. 
He wanted vengeance against Odin for all that happened to their mother, and while Velvet is able to subdue her brother, he tries to use the power of transformation again to stop Valentine from activating the cauldron. Unfortunately for Ingwe, the three wise men are one step ahead and manage to control him, forcing him to go on a rampage. Next up is King Galen. Galen is one of those characters you don't see that much but constantly hear about throughout the story. Remember that dark past I mentioned concerning Cornelius' father? Well, many years ago when Titania was being invaded by Valentine, Galen used the Book of Transformation to become the Beast of Darkova. However, he lost control of his power and Edmund, his son, was forced to use the sword Cornelius carries throughout his journey to kill him. Ever since then, Odette has tried to keep Galen restrained in the Neverworld, but thanks to Gwendolyn pretty much killing her at the end of her story, Galen is free to take control of the Halia and escape to the world of the living, killing thousands in the process, including Odin. The third disaster refers to the Inferno King Onyx. I haven't talked much about this dude at all this entire video, and that's honestly because out of all the secondary characters, he's the least important out of all of them. I mean, the characters do have interactions with him, but they're pretty minuscule in comparison to everything else. Odin supposedly offered Gwendolyn to him before Oswald came into the picture, so there's that I guess. But concerning the prophecies, it's written that the flames will be defeated by the World Tree. So Onyx assumes that in order to prevent his defeat, he has to lay waste to the entire forest of Ringford and the fairies. The cauldron is, well, the cauldron. Valentine finds a way to activate the darn thing without the need for the Ring of Tetrell, and sets the events of Armageddon in motion. The cauldron itself is pretty self-explanatory, but the twist behind this thing is that it's secretly a giant mech. Which kinda confuses me now that I think about it. I mean, if Odin and the Acer were able to secure the cauldron early in the game, how do they transfer such a huge object to their homeland? I mean, I know they have flying machines and shit as evidenced by the mini bosses, but you're telling me they were able to somehow transport this giant Miyazaki inspired abomination with little to no trouble at all? Moving on to the last of the five prophecies, we have Leventhin, the last dragon. You fight Leventhin as a baby a few times throughout the game, but thanks to Valentine and the power of the cauldron, this thing becomes a beast. The previous boss battles only show a small portion of the power this little guy has, so to see him absolutely decimating everything in his path is a pretty scary thought in itself. So now we have the five disasters, but what is the appropriate order they need to be fought in in order to get the best ending? That's where Velvet's old teacher, Master Croy, comes in. After finishing Velvet's storyline, Master Croy will give you a document detailing his thoughts on what the prophecies are referring to before he tragically dies at Velvet's feet. Going over Croy's memo, you'll discover the true character order needed to prevent Armageddon. Cornelius has to fight the Beast of Darkova, Oswald has to fight King Galen, Mercedes must fight King Onyx, Velvet goes after the Cauldron, and Gwendolyn must tackle Leventhin. All the clues are there to guide you in the right direction, with some just flat out giving you the answer like it's nothing. But if you manage to do it right, you'll be treated to the true ending of the game. And this, my friends, is where some tears were shed. If Cornelius successfully defeats Darkova, Ingwe tells Velvet that if the cauldron can be used to destroy life, it could also be used to give life instead, preventing the rest of the world's destruction. But alas, Ingwe succumbs to his injuries and passes on, sad that he never got the chance to see Mercedes one last time. This just gets me, man. It's so unfair. Poor Mercedes even finds Ingwe's body later on during her section of the chapter, and after a long and arduous fight against the Inferno King, also succumbs to her injuries, but not before revealing her true name, Yggdrasil. Yep, Mercedes was the world tree the whole time. It's hinted at a few times throughout the game that whenever a fairy dies, they reveal their true name like something out of an Earthsea novel. Unless you're familiar with Norse mythology, then this might actually be the one clue that could potentially trip you up. Same with Gwendolyn. I've beaten the game three times now, and I still have trouble trying to put two and two together when it comes to how Gwendolyn fits into the picture regarding Leventhin. Regardless, despite everyone's best efforts, much of the world remains destroyed, and with no more Fozons left to help rejuvenate the once prosperous land, it seems like the end. That is, until Velvet realizes that the ciphers embedded within everyone's weapons still possesses some magical energy. Thus, Velvet, using the Ring of Tetrell, offers up the last of the ciphers to undo the cauldron's damage, placing the Puka curse onto her as well. Well, that takes care of the interspecies relationship, I guess. Being serious for a moment, this ending is beautiful. Oswald and Gwendolyn become the heirs of the new world as the land begins to heal. Through all of the hardships these characters faced, you're left with a glimmer of hope. 
And if you manage to replay the final book to get the other bad endings, you'll even be given an extra cutscene that shows Velvet and Cornelius returning to their human forms. Yes, it took them hundreds of years to do it, but they successfully find all of the coins needed to grant their wish, and you're even given a glimpse of what King Valentine looked like before he was corrupted by the power of the cauldron. Such a great reward for all the hard work you put into completing the game. And if that wasn't enough, this game has the absolute audacity to show me a picture of Mercedes being reincarnated as the world tree with her cipher entangled in the roots. God damn it, game. Oh, and there's also this casting call bit with this merchant doing a stereotypical Indian accent, but that's not important. So while I've been gushing about how good the story is and how well this game plays, I've neglected to talk about just how gorgeous this game looks. Odin Sphere is truly on another level in terms of the amount of time and effort that went into the art style. The character animations, the backgrounds, the environments, Odin Sphere truly feels like you're playing a storybook adventure. And every time I go back and play it again, I notice something new every single time. Like how Velvet has boob jiggle physics. No, I'm not even being thirsty or anything. Apparently due to time constraints, she was the only character that was given that detail. Kinda odd, but okay then. But perhaps one of my favorite things about Odin Sphere is its soundtrack. The music was composed primarily by Hitoshi Sakimoto, whose list of credits is far too big to mention, but includes titles such as Final Fantasy XII, Vagrant Story, Tactics Ogre, and Valkyria Chronicles, to name a few. Now I say primarily because Sakimoto composed the soundtrack under his production label Bass Escape, and shares the credit on Odin Sphere's soundtrack with the following composers listed here. Both this and the soundtrack for Lathrasir can be purchased online, with Lathrasir containing brand new pieces made exclusively for the remake by Bass Escape. So if you couldn't tell by the length of this video, I love this game. While some of Odin Sphere's repetition may be seen as a turnoff for some, it doesn't deter from the fact that the game, or more specifically its remake, is an insanely well-crafted adventure with gorgeous visuals and some really good voice acting too. I totally forgot to mention that a ton of great VAs lend their voices to this game and put out some wonderful performances including Karen Strassman, Yuri Lowenthal, Michelle Ruff, Stephanie Shea, and Derek Stephen Prince to name a few. Odin Sphere is available on PlayStation 3, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation Vita. And while I think the asking price of the digital version is a little steep, I think you can get the game for much cheaper if you buy a physical copy. I got mine for roughly $30 off of Amazon, and I think for the amount of content available, that's a more than reasonable price. And if you manage to see the game on sale, snag it, because Odin Sphere is a truly special game. Not only did it save Kamatani's career, but it birthed an entire studio with a fascinating catalog of great games. Kamatani had faith in Princess Crown's potential despite its initial failure, and somehow managed to turn that into one of his most famous games. It may not be the longest RPG I've ever played, but it definitely left a bigger impact on me than some of the more famous franchises i played. The accessible fun combat and engaging storyline drew me in like no other RPG had before, and by the time I finished all the characters' scenarios and saw the end credits roll, I was sad that it was over. And when I cry at the end of a game, wishing I could experience what I just played for the first time all over again, then you know that you've made something that will stand the test of time. This is one game you definitely don't want to miss. I can't recommend it enough.